lasers. Here's our bore atom again. And now instead of 1, 2, and 3, we're going to put on psi 1, psi 2, and psi 3 to represent possible states the electron can be in that have some mathematical definition that we haven't quite defined yet. Um, and I've got an electron, which is in state 2. And I know that my electron, I can't point to it, and I'd say here, I has some, it's moving around, and it has some probability of being somewhere in this orbital. So what this might look like to the best that PowerPoint is able to do this would be something like that, that the electron moves around. It doesn't move in an orbital like a planet, but it sort of jumps around, and it, it can be in any particular place at any particular time. Um, if we were to bring in a, a photon and we were to bump that electron up to state number three, um, look what happens. Again, it has some probability of being there, sort of bouncing and jumping around, but overall the probability is in state three. However, during the time the electron is moving from state two to state three, which is not a tiny amount of time, it's a measurable amount of time, Probability tells us that it's a superposition of state 2 and state 3, and it's not in state 2 or state 3, it's in state 2 and 3. And again, the best that PowerPoint will animate like this is something like this, and the probability of finding the electron is sometimes in state 2, sometimes in state 3, and sometimes in state 2 and 3 simultaneously. Um, and this is important to understand because a photon of light, the particle of light, can cause an electron to do these jumps and move between these various states and be in a superposition of states. And in our in-class exercise, we're going to look at a superposition of states and begin to understand why light is emitted from atoms. Um, so that's as much quantum mechanics as I really want to talk about. And I'm going to go on and review a little bit of other stuff. Uh, let me point out here that, of course, uh, Electrons aren't allowed to be in between here. You can't move an electron from state zero somewhere in here. It just doesn't happen. Um, and you're pretty much aware of that from the optics class or other classes you took. Now, we all know that you don't find atoms isolated alone unless you're in the vacuum of deep space or in a, a gas at very low pressure, in which case the atoms don't bump into one another very often. They are essentially wandering alone in the dark. Um, usually what happens is in a, in a liquid, uh, you might have atoms that are sort of bumping into one another, very closely spaced. And what happens in this case is that the environment of each atom is affected by its neighbors. These two guys are pretty close, but there's a pretty big gap there. This guy has a big gap on this side, but a close neighbor there and a medium neighbor there. Uh, this guy's really close right here, and these are some medium distances. So one could imagine that all these different atoms have slightly different environments and the electrons in one atom are actually going to push on the electrons of the other atom and cause the wave functions or probabilities to change because remember negative charges repel each other there's a force that pushes them away and in fact this is what happens that in atoms the environment does affect the wave functions and what that means is that is that these energy levels aren't exactly the same as they are for an isolated atom. There's some variation in the energy levels. And you have to sum over all the different atoms using a statistical method because there's you know 10 to the 20 odd atoms in many things. Um, so you certainly can't add them up using uh, any kind of numerical technique. Uh, another way we sometimes find atoms alone, and this is often done in solid lasers, is we have some kind of very ordered crystal and we put a very small number of these atoms in here. Here's one. But again, the, the crystal that it's in and the exact location of the atom around its neighbors is going to affect these energy levels a lot. So the point is, real materials are made up of very many atoms. The atoms have all slightly different environments that torques these wave functions and means the energy levels the electrons are allowed to be in are slightly different. So we have to change our very simplistic picture of our Bohr atom which we've gone and represented this way with discrete sort of delta function like energy levels and realize that in real materials it doesn't look like this. It looks more like this. That instead of, of sharp lines, you've got sort of a, a, a range of energies that the electrons are allowed to be at. While it can only be at one energy in a particular atom at a particular time, when you have billions and billions of atoms, you certainly get a range of energies. 
And essentially what we do is we can describe a function that looks like this. So we take this energy diagram, because this is a little hard to draw and hard to deal with, and essentially what we do is we say these are the energy levels. Here's energy level zero, here's energy level one, and remember this zero is simply the, the, the highest lying level that's populated with electrons. Here's energy level two, energy level three, and so on. And we write that on the vertical axis, and this axis, the horizontal axis, is essentially roughly proportional to the probability of an electron being in a state at that energy. Um, so let me go ahead and get a, a different pen and a different color ink of ink here um, and point out that, that there is a very small and finite probability that an electron in energy level zero will be here because this is a non-zero number. There's a very high or much higher probability that an electron will be there a medium probability an electron will be there, and so on and so forth. Um, the same for all of these other, other levels. And so essentially what you have is a probability of an electron being at a particular energy level, rather than saying an electron is at a particular energy level. And we're going to see diagrams that look like this a lot in this class. And Certainly another thing we're interested in is how these atoms interact with photons or particles of light. Because if we have to make an amplifier for light, we're going to have to deal with atoms at some point. And we're talking in these pictures that have popped up about a process called absorption, where a photon comes in, takes an electron from this level, and I'm only drawing two energy levels here for simplicity, and takes it up into an upper energy level like that. Certainly we could have a transition that looked like that. We could have a transition that looked like that. We could have a transition that looked like that, all with different probabilities. I've just happened to draw this one. Um, and that's illustrated over here in our three-level diagram, where we have some electrons going from level 0 to level 1, level 1 to level 2, level 2 to level 3. And it turns out that if we then plot the transmission, the the amount of light that gets through this material that essentially 100% gets through the materials transparent unless you happen to be at a wavelength or photon frequency or energy that corresponds to one of these transitions and then you get a shape saying that you know there's a pretty low probability that this photon is going to get absorbed going to a high probability and so on and so forth and if you're thinking that, gosh, the shape of these, in fact, measure the convolution of E0 with the convolution of E1, then you're absolutely right. Similarly, let's get a different color here. Come on here. The, the probability of absorbing light is the convolution of E1 and E2 for that guy, and so on between E2 and E3 for the red guy. Um, we have a similar process when it comes to photons coming in and being emitted, because certainly when an electron falls down from this upper level down to a lower level, the energy has to go somewhere, and in many cases, particularly the cases we're interested in, it emits a particle of, of energy as a photon. And in this case, we have very no, little emission or no emission of light, except where the energy levels are. And so we get sort of an inverse diagram when we think about electrons falling down to lower energies. Um, and these types of curves we'll see can be used to determine a lot about laser materials and in fact can be used to plot out uh, what some of the energy levels look like. Uh, and we'll get into this more later, but I want to lay a little groundwork that and essentially what we're measuring when we look at the amount of light emitted or the amount of light absorbed is the probability of a photon interacting with an atom. If a photon comes along and has this energy level here, um, there's pretty much, well that's not a good way to describe it, if a photon comes along and has an energy that corresponds to the difference between this space and this space, there's no energy that matches up to that kind of scale. And so the photon is not going to be absorbed. If a photon comes along and has an energy that matches between those two, then the electron can move from the lower level to the upper level. And the probability of the photon is simply dependent on two things. Um, the size of the atom 
as measured by the photon. If it's an atom that, that looks large to a photon, uh, there's a good chance of it hitting it. And it also depends on the number of atoms you have in a given volume. If you have a very high density of atoms, um, there's a good probability you'll, you'll trap a photon or release a photon. If you have a very low, then the probability drops. And we'll be getting into this in future lectures, so 